Hey, I love that. We got some energy in the house of God today. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm so glad that you are here and uh, are joining us. We are in a series on prayer and specifically breaking down the Lord's Prayer and what it means for our lives here today. And so um, I want to begin by having us all recite this together. And I just want to encourage you to, to not just make this some kind of religious exercise, but to make this an actual cry of your heart. So let's read this uh, together as one church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, a quick show of hands. How many of you are cat people? Good, not a lot of you. Um, and then how many of you are dog people? God's chosen people? <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, that's always the best way to start a talk is by alienating your crowd. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I am a dog person. I, I love dogs. I've got a dog named Natty. You can see her picture here. Uh, she's a cute little pup. Uh, that's, that's my kids with her on the 4th of July. And uh, she's nine years old. And Natty's great temptation in life is anytime that any neighbor is walking by, she just freaks out and loses her mind. And uh, she, she can't help it. We've got like a four foot chain link fence and this like long sidewalk going across the yard on a corner lot. And she just loses her mind every time. And it always starts the same way. She's sitting right next to me and she kind of sees somebody approaching and I'm like, Natty, no. <laughs> and she, er, so then she stops. And then, it, and then they're getting closer, and then she starts growling again, Natty, no. And then the, the temptation is just, just too much. She cannot control it. She takes off running and barks her head off. And so most of the way I've met all of my neighbors is by just saying, I'm so sorry, we failed dog obedience school. We're hoping to do better with our human children. Please pray for us. <laughs> And, you know, the, the truth is, is that temptation can feel that way for us, where it feels like it comes on just so, so strong. And it can be really hard to be in control in those moments. And I want you to do a little heart assessment this morning and check, what is your greatest temptation in your life? Where are you most prone to kind of get off the tracks for what might be God's best for your life? And what's your strategies for making sure that you're going to stay on track and stay on God's best plan? Does it feel sufficient uh, for you? Because uh, when, I, when I listen to culture, they're, they're always telling me like, hey, the way you're going to do this is if you just like, you know, the way you could stay on track is just like, get your mind right, get your diet right, get your exercise right. Like you got to take your multivitamin. Uh, you got to start with organic juice every single morning. And if you do all of these things, you're going to be good to go. And still inevitably, we find ourselves in line at Taco Bell because <laughs> the temptation is just too strong or, you know, God's chicken, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, you know, like it, it's just, it's too much. It, it's too, it's too hard. And so the temptation is there. And so um, it can be something as silly as fast food, but there's real deeper temptations that we face as well. Like when we're out with some friends and maybe we're feeling a little bit of social anxiety and I just want to fit in and I'm going to feel a little more comfortable. And so we take just one more beer because it's not that big of a deal. You know, or maybe for us, it's that like we're going to watch that show or that movie that we know is going to put distance between us and our relationship with God. But everybody's watching it. Even all my friends from church watch it. So it, it must be good. It must be okay. Or maybe it's that late night scroll on a website that you know is not going to lead you to where, you're, where you want your mind to be. But the temptation there is strong. Or maybe it's even just the temptation that more is always more, more things or more experiences. I know that that's what the enemy often likes to tempt me with, is that if I have more or if I can do more things, I will feel more fulfilled. 
And so there's these temptations that you and I face, and I, and I want you to be able to wrestle through what that might be for you. Because Jesus once said to his disciples when they were tired and worn out, he said, watch and pray so you don't enter into temptation. So for you, as you do a, an assessment, what are the temptations that are unique to you and how you are wired and how you are made? That's what I want us to think about today and kind of dig up the roots of those temptations so that we won't fall prey to it. And to ultimately ask the question today, how do you not wreck your life? And instead, how can you stay on God's path for what he has for you? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So uh, in order for us to dive deeper into this topic today, we're going to look at a story of Jesus in the wilderness where he is tempted. And uh, where we pick up in this story, Jesus has been fasting from food for 40 days long. So you can imagine how tired and physically worn he would be at this time to, to, be, to be in this spot. And he gets right to the end, and, and right before he's about to launch into his ministry and about to change the world, before he's about to have his breakthrough, the enemy comes and meets him and starts whispering in his ear. And here is what the enemy of God says. We're in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. The tempter of the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Well, if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. So what are the temptations that, that you and I face now, 2,000 years later? And what can we pull and learn from this story as we break it down together today? Well, the first thing I think that we are tempted in, in our modern culture is to believe that Satan is not real. Like, like most people would say, like, if you're an educated person, you would not stand up in a room full of people and declare that there is a devil, and I think that our reason for this is not because we don't think evil exists. Almost everybody I talk to agrees with that. Like people are, are looked down upon and treated differently because of the color of their skin. That is evil. Like nobody's debating that with me. Or uh, people perpetuate violence on another person. That is evil. We have dictators who try to uh, overtake land that is not theirs. That is evil. Like there, there is real evil in our world. So our, our problem is not with that. Our problem is that uh, there's somebody kind of like in charge of this evil. And I think one of our main reasons for this actually just has to do with something as simple as uh, the depictions that we see of the devil. Like it looks like this, like this cartoon-like depiction, and we have this in our heads. And so, right, like none of us want to be associated with that. Like we think like that's embarrassing. Like that, that looks kind of stupid. Like, and that looks like a fairy tale. We, we associate it with like Santa type of a thing. And so for, for us, um, because we have these conjured up social, uh, cultural images, like, we just end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And the, the truth of what Scripture talks about is that Satan is actually a real being, and he's got a real job. And I don't know what he looks like. Like, me and Satan, you know, we haven't met face-to-face. -face. We don't hang out on the weekends. Not great for my profession um, if we were to do that. But, but he is an actual real being. And, and Satan's job, what Satan wants to do is he actually just wants to do anything he can to rob God of joy. And can I tell you something today? You bring God joy. Your life in and of itself brings God joy. Yes, even you and me who fall to temptation seemingly day after day, 
you bring God joy. God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son. He would do anything to come for you. That's how much God loves you. And so, uh, you know, of, of course, we've got to recognize in our lives that not everything we come across is the devil. Like God is omnipresent. He can be all places, all, all times, which is like a mind-blowing thing. Still can't wrap my mind around that. But the devil can only be one place at one time. So like if you have something go wrong in your life, it might be the devil or it might likely just be that we live in a fallen, sinful world. Like after Genesis 3, sin invades this place. And so now stuff goes wrong. And so I don't want to uh, end up having us give the enemy of God more credit than he deserves. Like that's, that's not a good place for us to be in. But we have to recognize there are two real kingdoms and they're both vying for our attention regularly. Now, in the story we looked at, Satan is, is kind of tricky. He, he, he tempts Jesus and he says this. He says, look at all of this that could be yours. You could be King Jesus and you could be King Jesus without having to go through all that you're about to go through. Like you're not going to have the cross. You're not going to have the ridicule. You're not going to have people spit in your face. You're not going to have people mock you. Like you can get rid of all of that. It's like a, it's like a shortcut to the kingdom. And he lays all of that in front of him. And I think um, what's interesting for us to look at is this is how Satan works. There's Pastor Tim Keller has, has affected many of my thoughts on uh, temptation and how to overcome it and how uh, to try to follow Jesus faithfully with my life. And Lord knows I'm on a journey here. But, but he says this, he says, uh, he says, what Satan does is he takes a good thing and he seeks to inflame your imagination so it becomes the ultimate thing. You see, what, what he does is he tries to lay out in front of us like all of this could be yours and you can do this and you don't even really need God. Like, you're smart. You, you know what is best. And this is, this is something that can become a litmus test for us is our temptation is to make something else more important than God. And the way we can, we can run this test to see, is something more important in my life, is to say, is, is this thing more important to my identity? Is it more important to my happiness? Is it more important to my meaning in life than my very relationship with God? And that's the thing that the enemy does, is he actually takes the good gifts that God has given to us, and he can twist it. See, Satan doesn't just go directly right to Jesus and say, hey, would you worship me? Instead, he tempts him with what is already going to be his mission, but he does it in a way that thwarts actually the way that God has for Jesus to do, which is a life of sacrifice for you and for me. And so here's the deal. If any good thing in our lives I mean anything. I'm talking about you being a father or a mother or a friend, uh, the, the very art that you create, the work that you do. And, and I mean the good work that you do. It can be a, an educational program that helps children. It can be a financial program that helps people out of debt. It can be a political program that helps serve people in need. Like all of it is good and important work and can be what you are called to. But if that thing becomes more important than God, that is where we can fall into the temptation. And, and when people start to come at that thing that we have put more important than God, even the very gifts that God has given to us, that is where we can start to really clamp down. And if somebody comes at us with that, like it's hard for us. It's not even just so hard that it's like, man, I don't like that person. It gets so far as we can't forgive that person. And the reason is, is because they're coming after the very thing that we have made our God. And this is what Satan does. He, he takes our good things that we have been given and he tries to twist them into an idol for us. And so today, what is it that you are most prone to having a good gift that gets twisted from the enemy where a good gift from God ends up becoming a tool of the enemy. Now, Jesus, when he's presented with his temptations, 
He's got a really clear strategy, and it's apparent at all three times for what happens. Every single time he comes back, and he comes back with the truth of God. He comes back to Scripture. And I think that this is a really important model for you and for me, is that when, when we are facing temptation, is to come back to what is good and what is true, what is from Scripture, what is of God. When, when we do this, it actually provides us supernatural strength and gives us incredible wisdom for our lives. But here is where it gets tricky, because you probably already knew, like if I'm tempted, I need to rely on God's truth. But this is what Satan did. All three of the temptations is he takes Scripture and he twists it for his own purposes. And he tries to say, well, this is really what this means. And our temptation for you and for me is to use scripture for what we want it to say, not what it actually intends to say. And here's how, here's how this works in our life. We come in and we have like what we think will be best for this world and will help other people. Like it comes from a good hearted place. And we come in and we say like, okay, this is what I want scripture to say. And then we go and we find the verses that will say it. And guess what? You can make scripture say almost anything. We've all seen scripture used as a weapon, which is not, of course, what it's uh, as a weapon against people. That's not what it's supposed to be used for. But we come in with our own vantage point, and then we find something to support our view. And now we can make it say what we want it to say. And this is dangerous for us because ultimately what that means when we do that, we become God. We are now in charge. We're now deciding what would be best for this world. That's a dangerous and arrogant place for us to live and walk our lives. And so this is dangerous ground for us to stand on. Instead, we must know what scripture says, and we must know the intent that it had for its intended audience, and then do the hard work to apply it here 2,000 years later. And I'll admit, this is tricky sometimes. Like, this is hard, and this is why I think it's so important for us to be in community, to be in groups, to be in relationships with other Christians where we can actually challenge each other and learn things from one another. But this is what I find so interesting about Jesus in this place, is when, when Jesus, whenever he's faced with his greatest temptation or even his greatest pain points, what does Jesus do? is comes out of his mouth innately is scripture. Like for you and for me, when we're in our biggest pain point, like we stub our toe and a four letter word comes out. Like, oh darn it, you know, <laughs> you know? And like, but for Jesus, when he's at his greatest pain point, when he's on the cross, he cries out from Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, as it says in scripture, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because in our most painful moments, the real us comes out. And for Jesus, so ingrained within him is his relationship with God that what comes out for him in his moments of temptation or his moments of pain is scripture is the truth of God. And it's because his relationship with God the Father was so tight-knit. Even Jesus, who walked and did miracles and served all sorts of people, oftentimes he withdrew from the crowd and he went just to spend time with God the Father. And why did he do that? He did that because his heart was infatuated with God the Father. That was the thing that was ultimate for him. And, and, and I think of it like this. It'd be like a cup that's already filled up with water. You try to dump more water into it. You can't get any more water once it's full. It's already been fully saturated, fully filled. And this is what it can look like for you and for me, is that our hearts can become so filled up, so saturated with the love and the beauty of who Jesus is, that when the temptation comes, there's, there's no room for it. I've already got my eyes transfixed on what is best and good and lovely and true. It's Jesus. So the question for us to wrestle through today, what is your heart ultimately obsessed with? 
because I think we can kind of waver in and out of like being fully in love with Jesus and fully in love with something that this world has to give. And what I believe is that when our hearts are most misaligned is when we are most likely to fall into temptation. Now, I want to give a, a practical example today and um, give, you, give you some tools. So one of the most pervasive problems in our culture today is one of pornography. And uh, everybody wants the, the church to talk about sex until somebody starts talking about sex. And they're like, uh, this is uncomfortable. Can we go to the next topic there? Uh, but we're going to go there today. And um, what I have found in, in uh, my conversations with people who are wrestling through this, who are struggling um, through this, whether it's um, occasional or even, even at addiction level, is the, the things that people try to do uh, to try to overcome it. The first is this, is I see people be like, okay, what I'm going to try to do is I'm just not going to think about this thing. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And as you try not to think about it, it doesn't really work because you're thinking about it. <laughs> so that strategy doesn't really end up working. Or the second thing um, that I, I see people do is like, I'm just going to try harder. I'm just going to, I'm going to try to just like, I, I know I can do this. And maybe you toss up a prayer here or there, but, but we just try harder. And ultimately what happens for you and for me is when we face the temptations that, that we struggle with is we fail. So I want to give you some practical ideas that, that might just help you today if this is your particular struggle and it can apply to other struggles as well. But the first, specifically when it comes to uh, pornography, is we've got to make it harder to access. Like, if you have all the time access to something that is really, like, always tempting you, you, you need to just put some simple blocks on there. Uh, like, you can just make it so that you can't go to any adult websites unless somebody types in a password for you. All you need is one trusted person uh, to be able to do it. And um, now you can make it so that it's not just there all the time. Like when you face that moment of temptation, it's just right there. And, and what I'll tell you is this can, this can really help. Like I think of it as like you would never put somebody who's a recovering alcoholic into a bar all day long and watch people drink. But like we have access all day long. And so we've got to put some parameters there and make our access more challenging. It will help for those moments where we're feeling weak. But the second thing that I think, just as a practical thing that can help us, is to recognize that the temptation is going to come in like a wave. There's actually like physiological studies that have been done that there's endorphins that are released into your brain and it, it comes on strong and it comes on fast, but it also comes on for a short amount of time. Like, it's like a 15-minute thing. And I'm not saying, like, set a timer and watch it go down. Like, that, that's not going to work out for you. But, but I'm saying it's like there is an end point. And so if you could just practically do something different, like get something, your mind engaged in something else, like maybe it's scripture or maybe it's a walk or it's a cold shower or it's like playing a video game. Like, I don't, I don't know, like some other vice that is actually healthy for you can be really helpful so that you do not give in to temptation. And one of the, one of the great things to know is not just that like temptation is going to come, it's going to come in a wave and there's going to be an end point. Like that is really helpful. I, I want to encourage you today. There have been several men that I have had the privilege of walking through who had extreme addictions in this sphere of pornography and have found freedom. Like if, if you're feeling discouraged today, like I, I don't think this is, I, I've battled this for way too long. Like you just don't know what it's like. What I can tell you is there is hope for you. There is freedom that is available to you. And the beautiful thing about what scripture promised to, promises to us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says there is always a way out of temptation. There always is for us, and that is a beautiful gift. But I will tell you, these are good, helpful, practical tips that I would encourage you to implement into your life. But can I tell you what the ultimate thing that is always the best antidote to temptation for you and for me 
is to fall more and more in love with Jesus. Ultimately, it comes down to this, being obsessed with him and his ways and his views on sexuality and what he says will actually bring fulfillment and not temporary satisfaction. The ultimate example is Jesus. And you and I today are invited to fall more and more in love with him. You say, all right, good. I got it, Jonathan. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. We're good. Let's pack up our stuff. Let's go get us a free donut out there and uh, I'll make some friends. Like we'll be, we'll be good to go. But what ultimately might dawn on you is this idea that the passage that we use today was Jesus and he was perfect. And you and I are not quite so perfect. And so what can end up happening is that we look to Jesus as the example, but it can actually become discouraging because we think, oh, I'm never going to live up to what Jesus is like. And this is the temptation number four for us is to look at Jesus as only our example. But my friends, I've got good news for you. He's so much more than just our example. He's our substitute. He came and died the death that you and I deserve to die because of the sin that we have done. He's more than just the model for you and for me. He's our savior. Like that's ultimately what he came back for. And even when Satan is trying to uh, tempt him, what he's trying to tempt him is not that Jesus would not just uh, be our example and like, oh, he failed. No, he's trying to thwart the plans of God to say like, no, he will not be the actual savior of the world. But the truth is, is that Jesus was the perfect example. And this is the great news is that this is, how, this is how scripture says it, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, when, when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, the, the righteousness of him, the perfection of him, gets put onto your record. It's like we were given a test, we failed, but Jesus turns in, a test for you and you pass the test not because of how good you were how moral you were it's because of how good he was and that he would be the sacrifice for you and for me you see when we look at Jesus as only our example it's discouraging but when we look at him as our substitute then it becomes encouraging and that's what can actually encapsulate our imagination. Or we could say, oh my goodness, Jesus, I am so, 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 so grateful to you and for you for what you have done. And we, we have to ingrain scripture into our hearts and into our lives. Like scripture is an amazing defense for each of us when temptation is coming our way. But what is scripture ultimately all about? It's all about Jesus. It all ends up pointing to him for you and for me. So why does Jesus go through all these temptations? Why does Jesus end up getting beaten to a pulp? Why does he let people spit in his face and mock him? Why is he pummeled on the cross? Why is he going through all of this? He's going through all of this for you and for me to show us his love for us and for us the way that we can face and battle the temptation in our lives is to respond to his amazing loving kindness and to fall in love with him. So I want to invite you this morning to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And maybe this morning for you, it's a situation where you, you just want to say thank you to Jesus. You just want to say, wow, wow. God, I'm so grateful for what you did for me on that cross. I didn't deserve this kind of love, but I am grateful for it. And you want to take a moment to thank him. And I'm going to give you a, mo in a moment to do that in, in just a moment. But maybe for you, you've never actually placed your trust and your faith in Christ Jesus. And you recognize that you can't really live up to God's perfect standard on your own but you recognize that there was somebody who did for you, someone who loves you, and his name is Jesus. So today I would invite you 
to put your hope and your trust in him. And that journey starts with a simple prayer where you ask him to be Lord of your life, to make him king over everything, to put him in the number one spot above all the gifts that he has given to you. You say that he is your ultimate gift. So wherever your heart is at, whether you want to trust him for the first time, or you want to express your gratitude to him, or you want to pray, God, would you help me face the temptations that I continue to face? I want to give you a moment to be still and to talk to Jesus. He is listening. God, this morning, we want to thank you for your extravagant love that you've given to us. God, thank you for always giving us a way out of temptation. God, I thank you for the gift of each other, that we can go to one another and, and admit to our struggles and grow out of them, that you don't just leave us entangled in our sin, but you give us a way out each and every time. You are the God of freedom, the God who desires that for us. And so we say thank you. We love you. We write your truth on our hearts this morning. Would you help us, Jesus, to be infatuated and saturated with you and your love? We love you, Jesus. Thank you for meeting with us here today. Amen.